Hi, my name is Josh and I am an FY1 doctor in Bristol and today I'll be covering diabetic ketoacidosis as part of one of the, a number of lectures on 10 minute medicine. Of course, I can't cover DKA in 10 minutes, all of it, but I'll be covering the salient points, the important bits for foundation doctors um, that will be really important in the coming weeks when you're starting. Now, there's certain things that I will and won't be covering now. I'm covering DKA in adults and fluid replacement in particular, in, in particular is different in the paediatric cohort. It's always worth consulting your local hospital guidelines. Places I've been at as a student and worked at have had really good guidelines on DKA. Uh, and all of the information from these slides, even the boxes that I'm using are from the Joint British Diabetes Societies, the JBDS sort of um, uh, guidelines online. And I'd really recommend checking those out. They're really good and have been updated um, recently as well. So let's start then on the diagnosis of DKA. So DKA can be diagnosed the D for, for glucose concentration over 11 or known to have diabetes. And we'll talk about uh, euglycemic diabetes, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, in a bit. The K for ketone, so capillary ketone concentration over three or significant ketonuria of uh, two plus. And A for acidosis, so a bicarbonate concentration of less than 15 and or a venous pH of less than 7.3. Now, when we're talking about the diagnosis of DK, it's worth noting that it doesn't just occur in type 1 um, diabetics. It occurs with um, people with type 2 diabetes as well, and um, particularly from sort of uh, Afro-Caribbean and Hispanic um, descent. So those sort of cohorts are, with type 2 diabetes are at higher risk of DKA. It's also worth noting that you know what you're looking at might not be DKA, it might not be diabetic ketoacidosis, but it might be alcoholic ketoacidosis or starvation ketosis as well. So quite often on the wards, you'll be asked to assess a patient with high capillary blood glucose. So say you've got a glucose of 14. The next question you'd ask the nurse is, oh, please, if you wouldn't mind doing ketones to look for those. And if the ketones are raised and the glucose is raised, you're going to need to do a gas to see if they fit the DKA criteria and, and if you know, you're going to need to start the DKA protocol. It's also worth noting at this point that actually getting a VBG is, is quite good. The correlation between VBGs and ABGs is sort of 0.035 of pH um, units. So they, are, they have a good correlation. So getting a VBG at this point is, is useful. And uh, you, know, you, you don't necessarily need a, an arterial blood gas unless they are hypoxic. So now let's talk about the immediate, immediate management of uh, DKA. So someone has gone into DK on the ward or in AMU via ED, and you've got to think about why. So have they got an intercurrent illness? You know, are they brewing an infection? Have we omitted their morning long-acting insulin dose? Is it a new diabetes, a new diagnosis of, D of diabetes? Have Has their insulin pump failed or their sliding scale insulin infusion failed? Uh, are they, you know, taking their insulin at home? Are they overwhelmed and depressed with uh, with diabe uh, with their diabetes diagnosis? And we know this is common in this patient cohort. That aside, treating all of those things is really important. But what do we need to do first? The first thing is, as a junior doctor, starting the DKA protocol, as I said, and running through it. Often I, I get the nurse on, on AMU to run through it with me, double checking everything that we've done, everything and making sure that we're both on the same page. And that's a really useful thing to do. So. We know that patients with um, diabetes are dry, so commencing the initial 0.9% a normal saline regime uh, as per your hospital guidance, commencing them on a fixed rate insulin infusion uh, at a rate of 0.1 units per kilogram per hour, and then assessing the patient as a whole, looking at their new score, their GCS, a full clinical examination, ordering a chest x-ray, MSU, blood, glu um, blood cultures, looking for that signs, um, signs of infection that you you, you, you may be able to treat um, and getting a full set of bloods and a gas including obviously formal blood glucose uh, you know uh, potassium and sodium things like that after you've established the initial treatment for DKA you're going to be monitoring as per the DKA protocol so initially sort of hourly blood glucoses hourly ketones and uh, gases um, I think initially at an hour and then two hourly uh, and, and going through uh, going through there. So, you know, talking about fluids, um, 
we we know patients with DK DK are profoundly intravascularly dry for for a very various different reasons. They're polyuric. They've got high glucose. They've got um, uh, you know osmotic diuresis. They're often nauseous and vomiting, and this all together makes them very very dry. So the most important thing initially, therefore, is is resuscitation of their circulating volume. So if if their blood blood pressure is low initially, and this this will happen if they come in via ambulance, they will be given um, a, you know a lot of fluid initially to try and to bolster this. And and if it is an issue, uh, if it is an issue, then you know getting ITU involved at an early stage is important at this at this point. Now. We know also that potassium is um, is quite important. So initially, um, patients are at risk of AKI if they're oligouric initially, uh, and we know that the insulin is going to bring down the potassium. So initially, in the first bag of fluid, we wouldn't put potassium in it. But after that, we're going to be looking at the gas and thinking, what's the potassium? What fluid do I need? If it's over 5.5, no potassium in the fluid. If it's 3.5 to 5.5, then it give 40 millimoles, remembering that um, you need it over four hours for that, and if it's less than three point five, then you know central venous access is probably going to be required, and then you'd need to get uh, ITU involved at that point. The type of fluid, looking at the guidelines, is quite a contentious topic. Um, the guidelines recommend normal saline, 0.9% uh, sodium chloride, um, and that's because it's readily available, um, but their studies so far recommend sort of no real difference between Hartman's and sodium chloride, um, and also you can put potassium in it easily. People from from intensive care will sort of say that obviously there's a there's a risk of hypochloremic metabolic acidosis with the use of normal saline and may favour Hartman's. But I think you know looking at the guidelines at the moment, normal saline is the preferred fluid. So there will be a regime on the DKA protocol that's uh, in your hospital, and it goes something like this. Of course, if they're going to need more fluid um, for resuscitation, as we mentioned, then that's really important. So what about glucose? So once the blood glucose is less than 14, then an infusion of 10% dextrose should be started. Uh, and it's often necessary to have both normal saline and dextrose running. Once the glucose is less than 14, the guidelines also recommend that you should consider reducing the insulin rate to 0.05 per kilogram per hour. And it might be worth talking to a senior about this. Um, about whether or not you should stop it. We know that these patients are at high risk at this point of hypoglycemia. So what's our targets? What are we aiming for in terms of DKA? So reduction in blood ketones by 0.5 per litre per hour, increase uh, venous bicarb by three uh, per litre per hour, reducing the capillary blood glucose by three and maintaining the potassium um, uh, between four and 5.5. And so there's quite a lot to consider in terms of, you know, sort of what we're aiming for with, um, with DKA. Uh, and looking at the next box on the guidelines, as I mentioned, let's talk about, so we've talked about the aims of treatment. We're talking about the reassessment of the patient. And this is all uh, the, you know, the nurses will have written at hour one, do this. At hour, do, um, do, uh, hour two, do this. We've got our fluid replacement that we talked about. And then, you know, what, what do we do if the patient isn't responding to the treatment? The first thing is to consider, is the insulin infusion sort of pump set up or correct? Is the insulin actually going into the patient? And if that is working, then it might be worse than increasing the insulin infusion by one unit per hour each hour until the targets start being achieved. Um, but this would certainly me, I'd be talking to seniors about this and, and getting the diabetic specialist nurses involved as well. As well as all of that, we've got to be thinking about the patient as a whole. Are we treating the infection or the cause? Um, have we got them on VTE prophylaxis? We know these people are at high risk of, um, of clots. Moving further on from this, um, we're talking about, you know, as the hours go on, you know, have they popped out of DKA? Have, has their DKA resolved? And should we therefore be thinking about um, resolution of DKA and taking them off the DKA protocol? Now, if you talk to the diabetic specialist nurses, they will say that um, this is the point at which uh, mistakes happen. And this is the point at which we, we need to be really careful about, you know, uh, 
are they are they still on their long acting insulin when did they last have their short acting insulin and after that then stopping the dka protocol and my experience as a nurse is a really really good at this but you're going to be when you're taking people off this protocol speaking to the, the specialist nurses speaking to the nurses um, who are used to dealing with this as well and also thinking you know what's the cause that they weren't taking their insulin initially if they're on a basal bolus regime and the hba1c is fairly well controlled then putting them back on their their long acting insulin that, that they're on before is a very reasonable thing but the, this is not something that you'd be dealing with as a junior you'd be getting the diabetes team involved for this one thing that it might be cropping up as a, as a consideration is whether or not HDU needs to be involved or ITU. There's certain cohorts of patients that we get a bit worried about. This is particularly young patients, uh, the particularly old patients, people with heart failure or kidney failure, um, people with a severe de uh, DKA, particularly when the anion gap is above 16, and then all the other things that we know is worrying in patients such as low blood pressures and, um, and, and, and low GCSs, and as we mentioned earlier about potassiums that um, particularly you know on admission or, or at the point of which they're diagnosed with DKA is less than 3.5 because we know we're going to need to be giving potassium at higher rates than we can do so on the ward. Worth considering at the end as well and this is is part of the updated guidance really um, when people are on all these drugs such as the flozins we know that these work um, by modifying uh, how glucose is reabsorbed uh, in the kidney and when patients are on these um, renal wasting of glucose um, means that you can't get a raised um, capillary blood glucose. So when p patients are on flozins, they're at high risk of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So patients can have a normal or slightly raised blood glucose with raised ketones and a low pH, fitting the criteria of a DKA. And in this circumstance, these patients should be treated exactly the same way as a normal DKA, um, but should be starting on a 10% uh, dextrose infusion uh, immediately as per the guidelines when the, the blood glucose is less than 14. So that was the 10 minute talk on diabetic ketoacidosis. Do check out the other videos on 10 minute medicine um, that cover a variety of different subjects. And as I mentioned, please do look at the guidelines online for this. They're really, really good.